Numbers chapter 11, we have been looking here at the, at the life of Moses. And as Moses has dealt with the people, uh, he has encountered some difficulties along the way. Um, the difficulties being the people. Uh, and sometimes that is what happens in life. Sometimes we deal with circumstances. Sometimes we deal with difficult people. Now, regardless of where the difficulty comes from, what has a tendency to happen is, is that we get weary dealing with difficulties. Um, we just get tired of it. By the way, that's why uh, God encourages us in Galatians 6 to be not weary in well-doing. Because you can be sure of this, if you're doing well, somebody's going to fight against you. Okay, there's somebody who doesn't want you to do well, and he will push against you. And so that's why we are encouraged, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season. There's a, there's a season of reaping coming. It may not be in this life. And that's okay. Um, listen to Brother John uh, giving the testimony tonight of just, you know, they're, they're planting the seed as, as many places as they can, but they're not seeing a lot of fruit. You understand what our responsibility is. God sent us out to plant seed. God did not send us out to, uh, to produce souls. He does that. He brings them into the kingdom. We're there to, uh, to get the seed out, and that's what we need to be faithful doing. And so I appreciate missionaries like Brother Mason and others, and so you, you pray for them. But as we deal with difficulties, it does become wearisome at times, and, and especially as it continues from day to day. Moses showed up to the children of Israel. It has now been somewhere, depending on who you read after, anywhere from 15 months to 18 months he has been dealing with these people. And we have yet to see these people be satisfied with anything. From the day he showed up, they complained. They didn't like this. They didn't like that. Well, because since you showed up, life has gotten harder. Friend, your life was hard already. Uh, and so, but they, they kept pointing to him and they kept uh, coming after him. And so, you know, we can put up with some difficulties for a little bit of time, but boy, we're ready to, we just, you know, we expect there to be a reprieve somewhere. But it seems here with Moses' life that has not been the case. The only reprieve he has been is when he's been in the presence of the Lord. And thankful that we do have that opportunity to go into the presence of the Lord, uh, to go and get rest and to be refreshed and all those things. But uh, every time he would walk out of the presence of the Lord, he had a whining, complaining bunch of people staring him down and saying, you're the problem. You know, sometimes that gets real difficult, especially when you know you're doing what's right. When you're doing what's right, and everybody keeps saying, no, you're the problem. Uh, that's where Moses was at here. And so, um, as, he is, as he's dealing with these things here, we finally find Moses coming to a breaking point. Look down at verse number 10. Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent. Let's just stop right there. You talk about uh, people who want to be uh, the center of attention. Goodness, if they'd have had social media back then, they'd have been taking pictures of themselves like this here and saying, look at this leader that we have. Look what he's done. And all we've got is this manna everywhere. And, it's just, and they're outside. They didn't keep it inside. They're, they're out there in their, in their tent doors going, oh, woe is me. Oh, it's so hard out of here. Oh, how terrible. Moses just let us out. Oh, he's just trying to kill us all. And their doors so that everybody could hear them and everybody kind of begin to join the chorus. You get, a, you get one or two people complaining. It's, uh, you've probably been watching the news and seeing what's going around our country on the college campuses around here. Now, I was watching a video the other day of a man who went up to one of these protesters. And they said, um, so what are you out here protesting about? And they, literally her answer was this, I don't know. <laughs> and so she turned to her friend standing over here and says, why are we out here? And her friend said, I don't know, everybody else was out here, so we just came out here to be with everybody else. Yep. Half the time they don't know what's going on. And that's exactly what these were people were. These were way back here before it was a cool word, these were influencers. 
they were trying to influence the people against Moses. And you can always be sure there will be those who are out there influencing. What a, what a sorry lot they were. Uh, then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent. And notice here, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. The last time that happened, what happened? Just look a few verses up there. Remember the last time the Lord was displeased with them? Uh, he sent a fire amongst them that consumed many of them. Yeah. This just happened. And Moses went and he prayed for them, for God to stop the fire, and God did. And now, as soon as the fire is done, and they go back out to the next morning to gather their manna, they start to complain about the manna. Did you not learn your lesson? The bodies are still smoldering. But that's, their, that's just their lean. They're always complaining. Always complaining. Do you understand why the Bible says there, Moses also was displeased. He is displeased. Now, our tendency would have been to turn on the people and to let them have it. And just, just oh, I brought you out of here. Now, he would do this eventually. Uh, he would lose it down the road here. But this time he didn't. But he could have very easily said, I brought you out of this place. We got you through the Red Sea. Uh, we got you away from Pharaoh. Uh, Pharaoh's army was destroyed. Uh, the, uh, the Amalekites, uh, they were defeated. Uh, the, uh, there's water provided for you. Uh, there's a shade by day and a, and a, a pillar of fire by night. Uh, uh, we got food every day for you. Your clothes aren't wearing out. What more can we give to you? Leeks and onions and garlics. Really? We want some meat. I just, just a constant, there was always something to complain about. And finally, Moses had enough. Now, I want you to see here something about Moses is that he doesn't turn on the people, instead, he turns to the Lord. That's a, bit, that's a big difference here from the way the people have been, because anytime the people have had a complaint, what have they done? They've gone after Moses and told Moses he's the reason. Moses very easily could have turned and told the people, you're the reason for all of my headaches. But instead he turns to the Lord. Now he's going to pour out his heart to the Lord. And if there's anybody to pour your heart out to, it's the Lord. Because he's the only one who can do anything about anything that's going on. Do we believe tonight that God is sovereign? Do we believe that God is all powerful? Do we believe that God has all things under control? Do we believe that God knows the end from the beginning? Do we believe that nothing catches Him by surprise? Well, if we know those things, then who else should we go to than to Him? Regardless of what's going on, even if it's uh, uh, some uh, difficulty that's come up, I was thinking about on our prayer list, uh, uh, th this, uh, we got the message this morning that Brother Bobby's, I'm sorry, uh, Miss Bobby's uh, 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 niece uh, passed away suddenly this morning out of the blue. Uh, no, no, no warning. That's a heartache. That's a heavy heartache that hits. And that's something that is, that is heavy. Can I tell you somebody who didn't know? God knew. God already had her days numbered. God already knew what was going to happen, and he was, He's already there. He already knows what's in the, in the tomorrow. So why go to anybody else but the Lord? And if we're going to complain, then complain to somebody who can do something about it. Now listen, here, listen to Moses uh, here as he begins his complaint uh, here with us. Uh, well, let me just say this here before we jump into that. Understand this here, people will displease and disappoint, which often leads to dis discouragement. And so just, just expect it. If you expect them to, dis uh, to uh, disappoint and to displease you, then it will be less likely to go down the road of discouragement. But we always get discouraged when we get dis disillusioned with those around us. And so we need to get our eyes set on the Lord. So that Moses turns to the Lord and he begins to pour out his heart uh, there to the Lord. Uh, aren't you glad that, uh, that God says in Psalm 103 verse 14 that God knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are but dust. In other words, God knows. You're not going to say anything to the Lord that's going to cause him to go, well, I never. He, he's never going to respond that way. He already knows what's in our heart. So go to Him. Pour out, pour out those things to the Lord and, and lay them out. Lord, here's what's going on. Here's how I feel. Sometimes we kind of, no, we, we kind of turn our nose up when somebody talks about how they feel. Listen, the, the God gave us emotions. Those are God-given. And sometimes they get out of whack. You know who can get them back in line? 
He can. So go and pour it out to him. Notice here what Moses says in verse 11. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? See, Moses began to think that this was all about uh, him, and he began to lose sight of the fact that God was sovereign, and he began to feel sorry for himself. You ever felt sorry for yourself? You're in good company. Moses felt sorry for himself. Uh, Elijah felt sorry for himself. Uh, uh, David felt sorry for himself. There, there's many people in the Bible who have felt sorry for themselves, but they didn't stay there. We don't, don't dwell there. Okay, uh, but here Moses, he's feeling sorry uh, for himself. Think about all he's done. He's, he's interceded for these people. He has, he has kept God's judgment back uh, from them many times. Uh, uh, he has kept God's presence to be uh, with them this whole time. And yet, what is the thanks he gets? You're the problem, Moses. So he comes and he lays down. He says, uh, he begins to lay out uh, here to, uh, to the Lord. He starts uh, in here. He says, first off, Lord, uh, you have afflicted thy servant. Can I just tell you, self-pity is delusional. The Lord hasn't afflicted him. And the, the God's not doing it. It's the people are, are yes, they're, they're being a pain in the neck. Absolutely. Okay? But this isn't the Lord's doing. But he says, Lord, uh, you have afflicted thy servant. Notice the next thing he says there. And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight? You don't love me. You ever accuse God of that? God, if you really loved me, you wouldn't let this happen. God, if you really love me, you would make this happen instead. We have a tendency when we begin to have that pity party, we begin to think nobody loves me, everybody hates me. Guess I'll go eat some worms. Right? That's how we feel sometimes. We come to church and we're wondering, uh, you know, God just, all He does is hurt me and He doesn't love me. Notice what He says, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me. Your call is too heavy. Uh, I'm, the, I'm carrying the load, God. I'm sorry. Moses, did you bring about the plagues or did God do that? Moses, did, did you lead the people out or did God do that? I'm sorry, did you part the Red Sea or did God do that? Oh, I'm sorry, there's a shade above your head right now. Uh, did you do that or did God do that? Oh, there was manna on the ground this morning for everybody to food. Now, did you do that or did God do that? Oh, there's water coming forth from the rock. Uh, did, did, did you do that or did God do that? See, we, we have a tendency when we begin to get discouraged and we begin to uh, have a little pity party that we begin to think, it's, uh, I, I, I'm doing everything when the reality is God's doing the heavy lifting. Right? And we we got to be careful because our human tendency is to go this regret. Now keep on going. Verse 12, have I conceived all this people? Let that sink in. It gets better. Have I begotten them that thou shouldest say unto me, carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? I'm just curious, when was the last time you saw a dad feeding the baby and not with a bottle? Do, do you see how ridiculous things get? Moses, you didn't conceive them all. Moses, you did not bring them all into this world. You did not uh, give birth to them. No, Moses, you are not. You're not no, you, none of the, this. No, Moses. How ridiculous. And that's, but that's what happens when we get discouraged. We begin to see things that aren't true. And we begin to accuse God of things that aren't true. And we begin to think we're doing more than what we really are doing. You see, Moses and his discouragement here is blinded by his own delusion. Continue with me here. Verse 13. When should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear all this people alone, because it is too heavy for me. Moses, you're not bearing it alone. God's there. 
and God's there to help uh, uh, carry the load. Moses, this is not for you to carry here. Uh, he just simply throws up the hands, if you will, and he says, I can't do it. If you will, Moses is hanging in, handing in his resignation letter. Yeah. I'm done. And that, Lord, if, if you're not, if you're not going to give me my release, and you're not going to sign off my resignation letter, then verse 15, and if thou deal thus with me, kill me. I pray thee out of hand, if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. Don't let, me, don't let me see me lose it. Don't let me see me get angry. Don't let me see wither away because of these people. God, can, can, you, can, you, can you empathize or sympathize with Moses just a little bit? Has there ever gotten to a point to where you just got frustrated with, uh, with people and you just said, God, I don't understand. I, I'm done with this. God, would you? Do? I, I'm finished. That's where Moses is at. You know what happens? We get tired. We get susceptible to the attacks of Satan. See, Satan likes to um, attack us in the mind. Now, go with me, if you will, to 2 Corinthians. I believe it's, I'm, I'm guessing now, I think it's 2 Corinthians. If I get there and I see it's not, it'll be 1 Corinthians. I know it's one of the two. It is 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Just keep your finger. We're going to come back to Numbers 11 here in just a moment. But look here with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Look down at verse number 3 to begin with here. Paul says this to the, to the church there at Corinth. He says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now catch verse 5. Casting down imaginations. How many of you as a kid you had a vivid imagination. Okay? Maybe you still have a vivid imagination. My wife has a very vivid imagination. It's awesome sometimes. As long as it's not against me, we're okay. <laughs> but you know, sometimes we have an imagination and we can come up with scenarios in our head and we're sure this is happening or that is happening or we're just, we're just having a good old time. I mean, you know, I like the kids that you just give them a, a, a stick and a, and a cardboard box and Eight hours, I mean, they're just having the time of their life. They don't need Xbox and PlayStation and Nintendo and all that. I mean, they got a couple things outside. They're off, and you won't see them for the rest of the day. Those are my kind of kids. I like those kind of kids because, boy, they got a vivid imagination. But here's the problem. Satan likes to use our imaginations. He likes for us to come up. Uh, this is where Moses is at. Uh, I, I, have I conceived all these people? Uh, have I had to bring them into this world? Or, are they all mine? And, and, and do I have to, as a nursing father, that's an imagination right there, Moses. That's not reality. Notice what he says there, verse 5, casting down imaginations. We need to throw those things down that aren't true. Okay? Casting out imaginations and every high thing, here it is, that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. In other words, take those things that you're thinking, compare them to Scripture. What does Scripture say? That's the knowledge of God we have. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Uh, we don't let our minds run wild. We bring those things into captivity. We, we put them in jail, if you will, and we don't let them out so they don't affect our, our lives and our families and our friends and, uh, and all of our relationships that we have. Uh, we got to bring those things into captivity. Otherwise, we end up in discouragement just like Moses was. Yeah. Look with me at one more place before we go back to Numbers 11. Go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And we are given the litmus test to run every imagination and every thought by to see if it's allowed out of your head. If it doesn't pass the test, keep it to yourself. Pour it out to God and let Him dispose of it for you. Philippians 4.8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. You take your thoughts through that ringer there first, and not just, well, it passed the first one. No, 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 no. See, it passes all of them. 
some things that are true are not lovely. Some things that you may think are honest are not pure. Get them out. Get them out. Get them out. Okay? We need to cast those imaginations down. If Moses had done that, it has saved him some heartache. But he was all wrapped up in his own imaginations and thoughts. And listen, I, I'm, not, I'm not angry or upset with Moses. Listen, we all get there. We get tired. And Moses was tired. He was exhausted. He's been leading these people for 18 months. And, and it, anybody who has had to deal with this kind of stuff, uh, wearing away on him. Listen, I get it. I understand why he's there. But listen, there is a solution. And it is found in the presence of our God. And we need to get there so we can get right with God. And let him get us straightened out. And sometimes it may be that we have to come in and just be still and know that He is God. And we just got to spend some time there and quit trying to come up with our own answers and trust the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to trust what you say and I'm going to take you at your word. It may not seem like the reality to you, but trust me, if, it's, if it lines up with God's word, it's reality. And Satan has got you fooled. We can't trust ourselves. Our heart, your heart, all of our hearts, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And so Moses is dealing with this here. And listen, uh, he's in a tough place. I get it. Uh, and so I'm not, I'm not wanting to jump all over Moses here. Listen, uh, Elijah was in that same place. Uh, Elijah got to the place there in 1 Kings 18 where he told God, kill me. Kill me. Same as Moses. I find it very interesting, and I don't know if there's any correlation between the two or not, but the two guys who showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Christ were the two guys who asked God to kill them. I don't know if maybe Christ was, was dealing with some, uh, the, the guys, you know, the disciples, and the people kept coming and going, and, and they would be for a while, and then they melt away. I don't know if maybe, the, maybe a, a Moses Elijah came back and said, we know what you're going through. We dealt with the same thing. We dealt with knuckleheads too. I don't know, I don't know why God chose them other than I know they represent the law and the prophets and those things. And I've heard a lot of explanations. I just find it very interesting that the two guys who said, God, kill me. I'm tired of this. Those were the two who showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Take it for what you want. Brother Tully, he can make a message out of that. I, don't know, maybe, you know, I should be like Brother Danny. Brother Tully, why is that? You know, so, but anyway, um, let's look here real quick. <laughs> the Lord's response. The, Lord, the, the Lord's response, He must, in verse 16, it surely says that God thundered down from heaven, and He must have lit Moses on fire, right? Aren't you glad He didn't? Aren't you glad that instead of God getting all upset, Moses, you've been in my presence every day of the month here, and you, you spent, spent two separate uh, stints of uh, 40 days on the mount, and Moses, you know who I am. And Mo God doesn't do that at all. Why? God sees our frame. God knows. And God knew Moses was tired. And God knew Moses was, was, was at his breaking point. And God knew. Aren't you thankful? By the way, that's why you go to him. Nobody else knows. Listen, even, even the closest person that you have in your life is your spouse or whoever it is, that the person who knows you the best, they still don't know you like God knows you. You know, I'm thankful there are times you can come in the presence of the Lord and all you can do is just fall before him sometimes weep, sometimes just fall before Him. Not a word can come out of your mouth because you're just so... <sighs> he understands. Aren't you thankful that we have the Holy Spirit who can take those groanings that cannot be uttered and He can go to the throne and say, here's exactly what's going on. Aren't you thankful that God is a patient God? Notice verse 16, the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation. They may stand there with thee, and I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the Spirit which is upon thee, and will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. Most I'm going to give you some help. 
Moses, I, I hear you. I hear you. You're, you're tired. And I understand you're tired of dealing with the people. Let me give you 70 men, 70 elders. By the way, when he says 70 elders, those are men who are already serving the people. These are the leaders amongst the people. These are people, remember way back here, whenever Jethro came, uh, he, he's recommended to Moses to take some guys and separate some of the duties out. These are people that were already serving. So they already knew the people. They already had a relationship with the people. I'm going to bring those guys here, and, and we're going to, I'm going to take some of my spirit, and I'm going, to, I'm going to put upon them. And I'm going to alleviate some of that burden for you. Look at verse number 18. And say, now, uh, say unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh. Moses had two things. I cannot give, I, I, I'm tired of leading them. And two, I'm, I can't feed them meat. So you know what, Mo, what God took care of? He gave them help for leading and I'll take care of the meat. Here he goes. Now, sanctify. In other words, set yourself apart. Get ready tomorrow. There's going to be a feast. Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and you shall eat flesh, for you have wept in the ears of the Lord. You did not weep in the ears of Moses. You wept in my ears. Saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. Ye shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month until it come out at your nostrils, and it be loathsome unto you, because that ye have despised the Lord which is among you, and have wept before Him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? You want meat? I'm going to give you meat. And I'm going to give you meat so much that it's going to come out of your nostrils and you're going to be sick and tired of meat. And here's why I'm going to do it, because you've despised me and my goodness. Verse 21, And Moses said, The people among whom I am are 600,000 footmen. And thou hast said, I will give them flesh that they meet a whole month. Shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them to suffice them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? Moses is trying to figure out the plan. You know what God says? Don't worry about it. Lord said unto Moses, is the Lord's hand waxed short? When God says go forward and so God says, I'm going to do this, just trust Him. Well, how is He going to do it? I don't know. But God knows. And I'm going to trust Him. Is his hand swagged short? No. Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. So God makes two promises. Number one, I'm going to give you some help uh, here. And number two, I'm going to provide meat. The two complaints that Moses had, aren't you thankful that God in his mercy answered Moses' prayer? He didn't ask. Did, did you see him request that in here? In, in verses 11 through 15, was there a single thing? Lord, I need help. Did he say that? No. He just said, Lord, you give me too much to bear. Did he say, Lord, uh, Lord uh, I, would you provide me for the people? No. He just said, how am I supposed to do this? Aren't you thankful for God's mercy? <laughs> Even sometimes coming to him with that, that attitude, God still is good. Verse 24, And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and they gathered the seventy men of the elders of the people, and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud, and spake unto him, and took up the Spirit that was upon him, and gave it unto the seventy elders. And it came to pass that when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad, and the name of the other Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them, and they were of them that were written, but went not out into the tabernacle. And they prophesied in the camp. So two guys aren't where they're supposed to be at, but God still gave His Spirit. Just, there's a lot of grace being given in this chapter. A whole lot of grace. And there ran a young man and told Moses, said, he, he, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, My Lord Moses forbid them. Now I appreciate Joshua. Joshua was loyal to the, to the man of God. He was loyal to the leader, and he didn't want anybody uh, casting a shadow against him. I can see, man, Joshua's blood pressure was going through the roof as it was. He was already agitated, all these people complaining of Moses. And now there's these two guys out here prophesying uh, out here, and, and he gets a little upset about that too. But would you see, would you see what Moses' response is? Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? 
Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put His Spirit upon them. Moses got him into the camp, he and the elders of Israel. You see a, a man, a young man of Joshua, you see a great mark there of him of being loyal, but I see with Moses a great mark of his leadership, and that was this. It was a mark of humility. I don't have to be the man. I don't have to be the man. I am glad that there are other people around here who can do some things. You understand that uh, every pastor who's, who's worth his salt, he's glad to have other people around. I'm glad I don't have to teach all the adults in Sunday school. I'm glad there's a brother Danny there. I'm glad there's a brother Borner there. I'm glad my wife is there, Miss Kay is there, and, and Brother Miller's there, and, and we got some that are teaching them. I'm glad we got uh, uh, those uh, uh, down teaching our kids, and we can go through all of our Sunday school teachers. I'm glad we got uh, Brother Jeremy and others who are down uh, in the junior church, and, and we don't have all, everybody all packed. We got folks who have the abilities to do these things. I'm thankful for them. I'm thankful for every person who's willing to step in and to serve the Lord regardless of where it's at. It's a blessing. Yeah. Anybody who says, no, nobody else, I've got to be the center of attention at all times, you got a problem. you got a pride problem, and God can't work through that as long as that pride's in the way. And Moses here, that's the last thing on He is so thankful. Why? Because he knows God is helping him. But notice here, the last part of this here, God comes through the second thing. Remember, Moses complained about, nobody's helping me. God poured His Spirit out, and 70 men now are there with the Spirit of God upon them to help Moses. The second thing, they want me. God, how am I supposed to give it me? God said, I'll take care of it. Just everybody sanctify themselves, be ready tomorrow. Well, how are you going to do it? Just wait and see. Verse 31, there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea. Let that sink in a little bit. Hunters, when was the last time you jumped into the bass boat or the john boat or the canoe, went out onto the lake? You went out there not fishing, but you went hunting for quail. That is not the place you find quail at, generally speaking. But the Lord's here is blowing this wind, and the Bible says, does it not say, and brought quails from the sea? How did he do that? I don't know, but I do know this he's God, and he can do whatever he wants to. He can make him, listen, he can make him appear out of, the, out of Clearwater Lake tomorrow if that's what he so desired. Okay, so just as you said, well, that doesn't make any sense. Just trust God on this one. He knows what He's doing. And let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side, and as it were a day's journey on the other side, round about the camp, and as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. So imagine all the way out past the encampment this way, and all the way out past the encampment that way, and past this way, and past that way. It's going a little further out, and all of a sudden these quail begin to show up, and they are all flying anywhere from this height on down. Anybody could get quail. Just take your stick out there and just begin swinging. <laughs> You're going to be knocking a bunch out. Notice what the Bible says. And the people stood up all that day, and all that night, and all the next day. Generally speaking, 6 in the morning till 6 in the evening, 6 in the evening till 6 in the following morning, and then 6 in the morning till 6 in the following evening. For those of you who are math challenged, that's 36 hours straight. The indication is the people didn't go to sleep. They stayed awake the whole time because they wanted meat, and so they began to knock meat, and uh, knock quail, knock quail, knock quail, and I mean, just going nuts. Notice here the Bible says, and they gathered the quails, he that gathered least gathered ten homers. I don't know if this is true or not, but I was reading and trying to figure this out because we don't use homers as a measurement. But somebody suggested, and I, I don't, this seems pretty extreme, but it might be right because it was going to last 30 days. 450 gallons. That's what I said. 
the least of them gathered that much. And they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. Oh, we're just having a good time. Just quail just as much meat as we can possibly. Man, they're just ch chawing down. Notice there in verse 33, And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, their wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people. And the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. I don't know if it killed them or if they were just smote with a plague. Like maybe everybody got indigestion at the same time. I don't know. Yeah, but all we know is that something plagued them. And all of a sudden everybody was not feeling so hot. They got what they wanted. And he called the name of that place uh, Kibroth Hadavah because there they buried the people that lusted. Somebody died. Somebody died because they said, I want quail. God gave it to them. Notice here just a few things about the judgment of God. First off, it was sure. He said it was coming. You guys think, if you get ready, it's coming. I'm going to judge you. It was sure. Number two, it was swift. As they're chewing on the quail, it hit, and then it was severe. We know it was severe enough that many died. In fact, the psalmist referenced this incident in Psalm 106, verses 13 through 15. And he said this here, They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. Yeah. You got what you wanted but you lost what you had. You got what you wanted. I was reading through, and boy, it's kind of a, it's kind of a scary thing as, you're, as you think about this here. You know, sometimes God gives to the, to the slothful person more opportunity to be lazy so he can kill himself spiritually. That person who is so lustful for money, he gives him more money so that it kills him spiritually. That person who lusts after uh, immorality and satisfying the flesh, he, he gives, he lets them have more of it so that it eventually it kills them. Sometimes the blessing of God is not giving you what you want. God may answer believers today in the same way. If we are guilty of complaining and continue to ask God for things just to satisfy our own fleshly desires, He may grant our request, but the result will be spiritual leanness. So let me ask you this, this evening, do you want God or do you want His stuff? If you choose His stuff, He may give you His stuff, but it may cost you your spiritual vibrancy. Boy, you know, it used to be the Lord, but I, I just really enjoy the things of the Lord. I used to be really close to the Lord. I used to, but I just don't feel as close. I don't feel like He's answered my prayers like He used to. I just don't feel uh, the, the same spirit. I just don't, yeah, it just seems like God's more distant. It might be because you're running after the stuff. They got the stuff. By the way, Moses, he stood back and you watched God do something. In your discouragement, what did God do for Moses? He lifted the burden. There's only one person who could do that, and that was God. Listen, friend, I understand there's going to be times we get discouraged, and we're going to have people that's going to come along and, and just wear us out. Weariness can enter in unexpectedly. Moses did not seem like a candidate for weariness and discouragement. He was constantly in the presence of the Lord. But he was taken by Satan, because he wasn't being watchful. Every one of us, that's why Solomon told his son, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Satan is looking for an open door, and he often uses discouragement to get in. We've got to be mindful, we've got to be watchful for what he is trying to do. When we are tempted to question God's goodness, let's rehearse his faithfulness that we've experienced through the years. Can I give you some things to do here tonight as we close up? First off, draw strength from His Word. When you get discouraged, pick up this book. When you get discouraged, get into this book. <clears throat> remind yourself of what He has done for you. I like uh, uh, <clears throat> Asaph as he's writing 
he's talking, I, forget, I didn't write down the, which psalm it is. It's in the 70s or 80s right in there. But he talks about there where he said he, he was looking at the, the heathen and the wicked and they were getting everything. And man, he was just getting so overwhelmed and he was getting so angry. And so why did they get everything and why am I suffering? And he was ready to quit on God until he went into the house of the Lord. And then he was reminded of all of God's goodness and all of what he is. And he was reminded of their end. And he was reminded of his eternal home. And as he began to rehearse those things, he was encouraged once again. Get into the Word of God. Get into the house of God. Hey, walk with him. Walk with him. During times of discouragement, that is not the time to leave the prayer closet. That's time to add on to time in the prayer closet. Walk with Him. Go back and remind yourself of His answers to your prayers. <clears throat> if Moses would have taken a step back, be reminded of that bush on fire in the wilderness. If he had been reminded of the blood that turned to water, the water that turned to blood, and the darkness, and the lice, and the frogs, the firstborn, and all those plagues, he'd have been reminded of what God had done. If he would have just went back and remembered as they were leaving Egypt, how the people of Egypt just loaded them up with all kinds of treasures. If Moses would have just went back and rehearsed what God did at the Red Sea. If Moses would have rehearsed what he did at the rock Horeb. If he'd remember what God did at the waters of Marah. If he'd remember what God did against the Amalekites. And, and how every morning that he has gotten up now for the last several days, he's seen manna fallen from the sky, or seen manna on the ground that's already fallen from the sky. If he had just looked up and saw in, the, in that hot desert, there's a cloud over us all day long. Wherever it goes, where we go is going to. I mean, we're, we're under that cloud all the time. And then in the night, whenever it gets very cold in the desert at night, extremely cold, well, there's a pillar of fire to keep them warm. If he had just looked at all those answers to prayer along the way, maybe he would not have gotten distraught. But before we get too upset with Moses, can I remind you, we do the same Let's go back and remember what God has done. Look what God has done for you. When we're overcome by discouragement, go to Him, spend time letting the Lord encourage your heart. 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 6, the end of that verse, after David came back and he saw the city of Ziklag, he saw smoke going up, everything gone, all the women and children are all taken, and the men that were so loyal to Him all spoke of stoning Him. The end of that verse, here's what the Bible says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. None of those men were going to encourage him that day. His wives and his family were not there to encourage him that day. He had one. By the way, he had been kind of doing things on his own. About a 16-month period right there where he'd been doing things on his own. He was in Ziklag, the land of the Philistines, where he did not belong. He finally turned to the Lord, encouraged himself in the Lord. And God encouraged him, and God then gave him direction, and God gave him victory, and God got him back where he needed to be at. And it was just a few short days after that that David was being put on the throne at Hebron. Listen, friend, we just need to get back to where our encouragement is going to come. That's from, that's from the Lord. Weariness brings discouragement. But the presence of the Lord and His Word, <clears throat> it'll bring encouragement to us. Father, help us tonight.